Basically, diversity is a code word for anti-meritocracy. Diversity is a code word for racial preferences. I didn't realize you used to be a liberal. When I started doing journalism in New York, I knew nothing. I saw the poison of big government, the insanity of welfare on demand. The students that are let in with lower scores have to retake medical licensing exams numerous times. Wait, they're taking that same exam again and again and again? Sometimes five, ten times, and sometimes they never pass. Heather, welcome back to PragerU. It's so great to have you here. It's wonderful to be with you, Marissa. Thank you. Heather, anybody who is living under a rock may not know who you are. <laughs> I uh, hope not. The rest of us call you the I told you so person. You don't say I told you so, but you told us so uh, (laughs) on so many things. I remember when I first met you, it was the narrative of BLM and police brutality, and you warned us. And then you started talking about DEI and what is going to happen in medicine and academia and the arts, and you warned us, and you were right. And now you're, you're continuing to warn us about very, very important things And so I look forward to this conversation because people are going to come out of this really armed with a lot of facts. And depressed, but we'll 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 know. We're going to to find a way. Truth is liberating. Exactly. We're going to liberate people with truth. So let's start with just your background. How did you become this person with discernment and instinct to kind of put your finger on this big cultural issue and say, you better pay attention to this because we're going to pay a heavy price? Well, I was fortunate to have a very good, solid education, and I saw that the things that I love, the things that have given my life extraordinary meaning, were being destroyed by the very people who have the privilege of passing on this tradition, whether it's literature professors or musicians that should know better, that, like myself, have seeped in beauty and have been given the privilege of reading the, some of the greatest works and to see the professors or the or the artists turning on that tradition broke my heart so i started writing out of a combination of sorrow and rage uh and and felt like we were putting our extraordinary inheritance at risk and at this point things i have to say marissa one wants to tell the audience, back up, we're winning. We're not winning yet. Uh, things do get worse and worse, and and it becomes more and more necessary to not be frightened by phony accusations, whether it's of racism or sexism. It's too late for that. We have to keep telling the truth. As an educator, when I think about you, I think about somebody who has been very well-versed in in the arts, in the classics. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about Heather McDonald, I say, well, she is fighting for what she understands is, is valuable and worthwhile. And when I look at our education system, especially in the United States, we are not teaching the things that you grew up to love and you and you learn. And so you know what we're missing out on and therefore you're fighting for it. But when we have generations of students who are not studying the classics, who don't appreciate what real art looks like, who don't appreciate what real music sounds like. They don't know what they're missing. And so they don't know what's worth fighting for. I saw that in the classrooms when I taught. We didn't teach these important things that you are saying is being robbed from us. And so do you think that maybe your deep understanding and appreciation just comes from the fact that you got to actually see it and appreciate it? I think that's absolutely right, Marissa. I am so grateful to the fact that my school had not been colonized yet. This was in the 1960s, early 1970s, where I still got to read great books without being told to bring a chip on my shoulder and say, oh, it's not written by a white female. You know, I I will not read anything by a dead white male. And I think children's ears need to be exposed to some of the greatest language that has been written to start understanding the rhythms that are possible in English, what the human imagination is capable of, whether it's the great British children's tradition of Wind in the Willows and Winnie the Pooh or Melville or Edith Wharton, Mark Twain, the irony and wit that has been passed down to us mere mortals that are inarticulate that are 
blind, that are stupid to human dilemmas and sorrow and pain, but erotic longing, longing for greatness. We learn from these greats. The attack on the arts is just, it's abysmal. I mean, it, to some it's ridiculous, but it's also, it's its really heartbreaking and dangerous. It's totally heartbreaking. We should be down on our knees in gratitude before the great works of Western literature, Western music, art. And instead, students are being taught to hate things of sublimity, of joy, by professors who've been given the greatest job in the world. As again, this is what I aspired to be. I could think of nothing more privileged than to be able to read these works and pass them on to students to say, why should you be down in your knees in gratitude before William Wordsworth, before Edgar Allan Poe? And instead, these professors are turning on their own traditions and are teaching them that these are works that you should disparage and that you can happily, without uh, sort of uh, any kind of, of second thoughts, graduate from college without having been exposed to. This is a complete betrayal of the guardians. On the other hand, I would say that there's a lot that I did not know growing up. I was a liberal by default. I grew up in West Los Angeles, and it was a typical coastal elite culture. So I absorbed all the way, all the way past into law school, the knee jerk assumption that somehow we live in an unjust society and that if there's differences in wealth, that's unfair and capitalism is unfair. Without thinking deeply about these things, I was not heavily political, but I was your typical parasitic, well off kid parasitic, not just on the immediate environment, but on the entire tradition. And it is only probably in the last 10 years or so where I look around my environment at like on a daily basis, it all amazes me. This thing is amazing. Clean water is amazing. Fresh milk is amazing. Lack of early maternal mortality is amazing. Every single material in our world. Some materials engineer someplace crafted that thing. Plastic bags. I'm really going to break a taboo. Oh. They are amazing. Plastic. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you, Heather McDonald? <laughs> but anyway, one can overcome the blindnesses that are part of the decadence mm -hmm. of an affluent Western society and and start to see greatness that you didn't even appreciate before. I didn't realize you used to be a liberal. So yes. what happened? Was there a moment of, of transformation for you? Well, I was always a very serious student. I always loved studying. I was the student in this library, not doing the partying, which is boring, but, but still I'm very grateful to having been given that opportunity. Um, so I had aspired to be a professor of comparative literature and was picking up languages. What started happening to literature after I left was, or was in graduate school, was the rise of feminism, multiculturalism, mm -hmm. black studies, identity politics, which was worse because yes, it, it, was, it was telling students hate the past. It was giving students an easy excuse for their ignorance that this was a past that is white male and therefore inherently corrupt and oppressive. So that started getting me very angry, even though my political inclinations were still, just as I say, a dopey, mindless liberalism. I also was always against attacks on meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So I never was in favor of racial preferences. So that was also turning me then I came to New York City in the new, in the 1990s, and I'd never done student journalism, which I really regret. Like any listeners of you guys that are student journalists, go for it, guys! Like you are getting some of the best training mm -hmm. to be able to write quickly under deadline, something that I still cannot do. Uh, but I was asked. I started writing about the revolution in urban governance under the then brilliant Rudolf Giuliani. And this was something I didn't know anything about. I didn't know about conservative theory. I'll confess, I didn't even know what National Review is. I'd never read commentary. I'd been completely innocent 
as a product of the coastal elites, sure. of the conservative discourse, I learned it on the ground through empirical work. I saw, not through any pre-existing conceptions, the poison of big government, the insanity of welfare on demand, of asking nothing of people getting a government check. I heard from welfare mothers, they should have started this welfare reform decades ago. There's welfare mothers that are so lazy, they won't even change the 40 watt bulb. There's welfare mothers that are having more children to get a bigger check. Mm -hmm. Just what the Republicans were saying, and I was hearing it on the ground. So that physical, daily, empirical experience with the failures of great society programs and a better way to do things, which now we thought in the 90s, the transformation of New York was so profound and so unexpected, we never would have thought it would have been so fragile and evanescent. And it is has all been thrown out now. And New York at present is worse than when I came in the late 80s. So anyway, that was how I became a self-conscious conservative after having not really thought about those matters. And it's amazing to me that a place like the New York Times can send reporters to the same places I visited, to the welfare centers, to the homeless shelters, and still hold on to their failing ideology. I, I can't understand it because to me, it was it was right before your eyes. I mean, there was no way to maintain the fiction that the welfare state was was successful. Well, because I would imagine that so many of these journalists are actually ideologues. And when you say that people should go and get a degree in journalism, I don't not know. Not a degree. No, not a degree. I'm, or a training. A journalism degree is completely bogus. Yeah. No. Here's what you do in college. You read great books right. and you learn the periodic table to the extent you can handle physics or physics for poets, which is even more than I could handle. Right. Do that. You you have to at least understand the beauty of the scientific method. But your main experience should be these are four precious years to mm -hmm. cram into my empty noggin as much greatness as possible. Marketing degrees break my heart. Journalism degrees break my heart. That's not, no, I'm saying yeah. be a journalist. Write oh. for your student newspaper. Mm -hmm. You don't Get need a journalism practice. Degree. Get the, the practice trade. of actually reporting on something and trying to work under deadline. To Completely. Craft. It's the best way, the right. best way to work. Were you, did you ever do student journalism? I mean, under Dennis Prager for the last 13 years, I know I never did journalism, but I, I, I've always been a curious person. Uh -huh. And like you, That's I right. started experiencing things. And so I started speaking out. And you know what? The best way to learn something is to just do it a thousand times. Right. You just and get to better. realize your ignorance. Like yeah. that was my value added is I knew when I started doing journalism in New York, I knew nothing. Mm. My only value added was being willing to go out and do the footwork and talk to people. Journalism is an excuse to make up for your vast ignorance about the world. Mm -hmm. So that's really fun. So yes, curiosity yeah. helps. The best journalists are the non-ideologues, right? The right. ones who are actually willing to seek truth and, and actually seek it and not show up and, and write the truth that they want to hear. Well, that's very hard to overcome your prejudice. I mean, yeah. I'm very conscious of our cognitive biases that we do select the facts that confirm what we already mm -hmm. know. How you get to those biases in the first place is, is sort of mysterious. But I try and stay an open mind, but I have to say there's certain things that I've made up my mind about. You're not going to be able to talk me into uh, any proposition, for instance, that the police are the big threat facing black men. It's just not true. So I don't care what sort of bogus study you're going to show me. That one's right. off the table. Well, you investigated enough and, and know your stuff. I I'm curious about DEI because the our our friendship started really with with this issue of mm -hmm. of DEI. Now people are talking about DEI all the time. When we started talking about DEI, they didn't quite know what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so is DEI a new thing? Like what's the history behind it? Is there a nef an nefarious puppeteer that is trying to take America down through this DEI woke mind virus or is it just sheer stupidity that's getting out of hand? Uh, we've been living with it and people haven't paid attention for a long time. It really began bizarrely in the business environment, in the corporate setting, where uh, we had had racial preferences, we'd had racial quotas, and people were being hired 
with lower set of qualifications than their peers and they were not doing as well. And so immediately the exp only allowable explanation was not, well, the problem is we have double standards in hiring. What do you expect if you bring people in that have less you know, literary li linguistic skills or, or arithmetic skills than others, they are going to struggle. We had a whole set of hustlers that came into being that were the diversity consultants, the corporate diversity mm -hmm. consultants, our Roosevelt Thomas being one, who wrote books. There was the all these different facile concepts of managing diversity, that if you're a white manager, you need to be trained in order to manage diversity, which is code for managing black people. And so people got all upset when the Smithsonian Institution, after the George Floyd race riots, was publishing this on its website. This was a very old concept that promptness is a white value, and it's racist to expect black people to be on time. Our Roosevelt Thomas back in the 90s was was counseling corporations don't expect accuracy, don't expect uh, promptness, don't expect respect for authority because that's not valuing diversity. How is that not racist? That that I know. comment is racist. It's to racist. say that there is a race that can't be prompt, that is racist. Well, you know, we've had this phrase black person's time for a long time and you know, with Clinton was that was he was both black because he was late all the time. So these ideas have been in the culture for a long time. So you have the corporate world spawning this. And then in academia, you had an even worse problem of racial preferences. Basically, diversity is a code word for anti-meritocracy. Mm -hmm. Diversity is a code word for racial preferences. And the problem is the reason we have all of these massive bureaucracies, all of this rhetoric is very sadly, and this is something that Americans are so well-meaning, they don't like to talk about. It's a very uncomfortable topic, and I wish I didn't have to broach it, but again, as I said before, it's too late. The time for racial etiquette even is too late. You've got a very large academic skills gap that is persistent. It's been around for decades, and it's very troubling. 66% of black 12th graders do not possess even partial mastery of the most basic 12th grade math skills, such as being able to do arithmetic or read a graph. The number of 12th grade black students nationally who were proficient or advanced in math is too small to show up statistically. These are huge, huge gaps. According to the ACT, only 3% of black high school seniors are ready for a STEM degree. What this means is when you go to Google and you say, if you don't have 13% black engineers, because that's the proportion in the population, you're racist. Well, wouldn't they say that the reason these numbers, the performance numbers are so low is because our institutions are racist and they're not giving enough resources to these inner city communities, which are likely black, and therefore they're underperforming because they're quoting the same numbers that you're quoting. They don't quote it. No, that's, they will not admit that. I mean, that's But they'll say, oh, rare. but it's because they're not getting resources if and because our it. institutions are racist. And so we're not supporting them with what they need because they should be able to pass all the STEM tests. They should be able to. And the reason they're not is because America is not providing them with the resources and the opportunities to get there. That's what they would say. Right. I'm not going to deny that there are some educational environments which are absolutely stunningly lavish, and I was privileged enough to go to some of those. I mean, some you look at these East Coast prep schools, it's, it's almost decadent and sinful. They are so well endowed. But <laughs> when you look at per capita funding for public schools, there is no correlation between per capita funding and outcomes. Title I is a federal welfare program for schools that ladles taxpayer dollars, takes it, you know, sucks it up from local taxpayers nationally, sends it to the Department of Education, lots of bureaucratic spending taken out, and then funnels it back to so called, you know, poor, under resourced schools. You can have the Newark school system spending 30000 per capita on students, and those students are still failing. Meanwhile, you've got a struggling Catholic school that's maybe spending 6000 per student, and those students are doing well because there's high expectations, there's order in the school, and you have often families that are put more emphasis 
into education in the home. At this point, the the financial explanation simply does not hold up. There's just no correlation, Marissa. And this is just an excuse. Frankly, America is not a racist country any longer. It was. It was heartbreakingly cruel to blacks, way beyond slavery. In a sense, slavery is almost the least of the problems. I find 20th century American history even more unbearable in the gratuitous cruelty of whites towards blacks. We were white supremacists. The white identity, certainly in the South, but in a lot of other places in the country, was dependent on keeping blacks down. We are not that country today. As impossible as it would have been in the 1950s to imagine the sea change in Americans' racial identity, it is real. The, the, the reality today, Marissa, is black privilege, not white privilege. I will believe in white privilege the first time I see a black student put his race down as white when he's applying to college because he thinks that being white will give him an advantage. The reality is the opposite. If you're a, if you're a heterosexual white male today, you are the last person that's going to be admitted to medical school, to law school. You will need SATs, LSATs, MCAT scores, the medical college admissions tests that are 100%, 200% better than black students. You, If you presented their qualifications, you would be automatically rejected. So our institutions are not to blame from a racial perspective. Are our schools the best they could be? No, they're lousy. They're pathetic. They've been taken over by a anti-meritocratic ideology. But to be perfectly honest, what also needs to happen is a sea change in inner city culture. If every black parent acted like an Asian parent with the same fanatical attention to their children's doing homework, taking textbooks home, the, if the parents said, if you get an, a B plus or an A minus, you have failed, the skills gap would go away. And the whole DEI complex, which is simply about making excuses for black underperformance and saying the problem is racism rather than something that is more difficult to tackle, it would all go away. The only reason we talk about DEI is the skills gap. So I want to talk a little bit about medical school yeah. because you you mentioned some of the numbers. I looked into some of the numbers. I've actually spoken to some people who are sitting on some of the you know most pre prestigious universities in the United States who look at the applications that are coming in, and they are basically told. You you, you mentioned the MCATs. They're basically yeah. told that if if it's a, a minority, they can come in around thirty one right. uh, score, but if it's Asian or white, they need to come in around thirty nine. Yeah. Right, and so somewhere there is an an average over there, which you know that is effectively racism, right? Treating one race differently from another race, but in their defense what they are saying is that they have to lower the scores and and the the i guess the threshold to get in because they do need to have a larger representation from minorities and the reason that is so important they're claiming is because diversity helps medicine a more diverse medical healthcare system is a better healthcare system. That is the claim. And so given that these kids are coming from underprivileged schools where the parents are not in, maybe as involved or they can be involved because they're all working or whatever it is, we need to lower the threshold so that the kids who actually want to become doctors can get in. What's mm -hmm. your answer to that? Well, first of all, a lot of your listeners are probably thinking they get in, they get the remedial help and they catch up. Yeah. You know, that, that just were, there was a, a false impression of lack of skills it was just because they didn't have the training. It never happens. They do not catch up. Not only are we lowering the standards of admission for blacks and Hispanics, we are lowering the standards of qualifying doctors because predictably, if you let students in with inadequate academic skills, they fall behind. They learn less. They can't keep up in their classes. And so the gap continues. And so they're also failing 
the licensing exams disproportionately in the same degree that they fail the medical college admissions test, there's never a moment of reckoning where we say, from now on, we're going to a colorblind standard of achievement. We have double standards in licensing. So now, two years ago, there, the first step of medical licensing is, is, is what's now called step one of the, of the medical licensing exams that's taken after the second year of medical school that tests, have you learned anatomy? Have you learned physiology? Have you learned drug interactions so that if somebody's on a cancer drug, you don't want to give this particular type of diabetes drug because they're going to have a heart attack? Have you learned these basic processes of how the body works? That score was being used for hospitals to select their residents, you know, the, mm-hmm. the in-house training that medical students get in their third year to really get hands-on clinical practice. Black students were doing very poorly in step one. Rather than rethinking admissions and saying maybe we should be more selective and actually make sure that we're only admitting students who will succeed and not fail, we decided to get rid of the grades. So that the hospitals choosing their residents now go blind. It's just pass-fail. So it's a very crude distinction, pass-fail. There's a lot of difference between the pass at the high end and pass at the just squeaking by end. But now they're all treated the same. So you're saying that it's possible that some of the medical schools are actually graduating doctors that are not competent? Do we believe that there's differences in knowledge and skills or do we not? If we don't believe that tests measure something, we should just do a lottery for everything. Why not just come to this room and you're, we'll, you, we'll use your text and we'll do a lottery and we'll say, well, we can all do medical science. Why should you test our skills? Of course it matters. And of course, if you lower the bar, you are going to get doctors who are not as competent. There are, there are mass data studies that have shown this. The students that are let in with lower scores have to retake medical licensing exams numerous times because they can't absorb the material. There is a correlation between the number of times a medical student has to take a licensing exam and the rates of malpractice and patient death. Wait, they're taking that same exam again and again and again? Sometimes five, ten times, and sometimes they never pass. Can you imagine somebody having to take an exam on your brain or on your surgery again and again and again? I mean, how how does how is that okay? Well, you've actually did an insight that apparently eluded the medical profession for years. Back in the 1990s, a wonderful husband-wife pair of researchers, Stefan and Abigail Thernstrom, uh, wrote a book about the problems we have with our racial politics and policies that was a response to a very influential and very misguided book called Shape of the River. And the Thernstroms noted that a doctor who has to spend a lot of time again and again going over the same material just to pass his licensing exam is very unlikely to be able to keep up with developments in his field. Of course, it shows lack of instinct and lack of ability to discern. To discern and to absorb new material. And and so this was kind of obvious to them. Uh, And there was a doctor, again, this has been going on for a long time, Marissa. We're only now, enough people are paying attention. In the 1980s, there was a Harvard Medical School professor who wrote a completely anodyne op-ed in the Journal of American Medicine Association, JAMA. And he said, I understand that doctors believe that they have to wage a social welfare crusade and they want to be liberal, but their primary obligation is to the safety of their patients, and that means they need competence. And he said, I think we have gone too far in the social justice side of things. And he talked about anonymously a student that failed a licensing exam five times that was, the licensing exam was then being used by his medical school to credentialize students to say you can graduate. He he failed it five times and the school decided to graduate him anyway. It turned out later that this was a Harvard student, that this guy, Bernard Davis, and he's written a great book, which you can order about 
the medical diversity uh, boondoggle, among other things, he was viewed as a pariah when they when it came out this was Harvard, or even if it hadn't known it was Harvard, but if he was talking about against racial preferences, Bernard Davis's career was basically over because he had spoken the truth mm. about the fact that racial preferences are not a benefit. You are harming their beneficiaries. You are setting them up to fail, to at least to struggle, to go through psychological difficulties of not being competitively qualified. Last year, a black engineering professor at MIT was honest enough, a professor of mechanical engineering who had gone through MIT before preferences, he was honest enough to talk about the heartbreak that he sees the black MIT students go through year after year under a racial preference regime of struggling and failing. And he said, this isn't working. This is cruel to these students. Did his essay make a damn bit of difference? Not really. Right, because you're you're referencing the fact that now medical schools are paying so much attention to their essay, and the essay is about diversity, equity, inclusion, their lived experience. You, you mentioned the the uh, JAMA mm -hmm. research, right? So I'm actually holding it in here, uh, in this packet here, and one of the things that they say in this research is that diversity is very important in the medical field because if you have if if you are of, of a certain color or or of a certain background let's say you're latino you're likely to be a better doctor for somebody of the same color mm -hmm. and that is because supposedly the patient will be more comfortable and so if you are a black patient you would be more comfortable going to a black doctor and if you are a latino patient you would be more comfortable going to a latino doctor and they're saying that that is the that is the reason why the bar needs to be lowered or that the gates need to be widened a little bit in order for these diverse students to become medical doctors because they would be better doctors because the patients would be more comfortable mm -hmm. well first of all i just it's very hard for me to believe that anybody, if informed of the fact that you can choose a doctor of your color who's did much more poorly in medical school versus one who's not, you're really going to choose the guy that, that struggled to understand microbiology and the Krebs cycle. I don't believe that. But even if so, um, it's sort of a self-creating problem because, in fact, Blacks are being pumped with this ideology that science is racist. You know, we always hear about the Tuskegee experiment, which was much more complicated than we've been led to believe. But let's say, worst case scenario, it was uh, a cruel effort at medical experimentation. That was many decades ago. That is not our reality today. But if Blacks are being told that white doctors are racist and they're going to operate on you without your consent, uh, there may be a shred of truth to that. But that's the fault of the diversity industry, which is broadcasting at every possible opportunity that Western science, which is the flower of humanity, which is one of the most extraordinary accomplishments of overcoming rank ignorance, superstition, phony cognitive mistakes of, you know, causation, correlation matters. The beauty of the, the double-blind, randomized controlled experiment is just an incredible breakthrough. And if, if we're being told to hate that and to, you know, suspect it, well, you know, we're, we're going to get what we deserve to a certain extent. Nevertheless, I would say that there's an entire industry out there which is dedicated to saying that racial disparities in health outcomes can only be the result of racism mm. in a completely dangerous, irresponsible way. The Scientific American, in its 
his post-George Floyd race riot hysteria that took over the entire culture in the summer of 2020 when every mainstream institution was beating its chest and apologizing for its phantom racism and accusing everybody else in the culture of racism, Scientific American came out with an entire issue dedicated to the various ways that the United States remains systemically racist. And one of the ways was to talk about obesity as a health risk for black women. That now is racist. The only allowable explanation for poor health outcomes for black women is racism on the part of, of doctors. Uh, and of course, this is completely counterproductive because for all of us, Americans' behaviors around health are abysmal. If you eat too much, if you don't exercise, if you smoke, if you take drugs, you're going to have problems. And for us to pretend that, that none of that matters is against the Hippocratic Oath. But doctors in medical schools, these medical schools are total left-wing factories now. The, the feminist race hustlers are being told, you cannot talk about obesity because that's a racist issue. Uh, so we are giving precisely the wrong address. And as far as the racism of saying a black patient needs a black doctor, it is such an insult to doctors. When I've written about the medical profession, now they may all be self-blind to their own failings and prejudice, but you can talk to doctors and they say, "I there is no way that I am treating my patients differently. I care about all of my patients. The reason I went into medicine is to save lives. The idea that I'm giving, you know, better medication to white patients or better painkillers to white patients than black patients. It's just not true. I mean, just the irony behind the fact that probably people who are watching you right now are yelling at the screen and <laughs> commenting below saying that you're a racist. Yeah. The irony behind it is the fact that they are saying that the patients are racist enough mm -hmm. to say, hey, if I see that that doctor is not the same skin color as I am, yeah. I'm not going to go in there. I don't want to be treated by them. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine a white person saying, I will not go to a doctor who is not white? Right. Can you just imagine? Oh, I know. But the fact that any other race can say that, why would they say that? Why are they believing that people are actually, that patients are racist? Why are they believing that? Well, they're believing it because the culture is pushing this garbage on them from cradle to grave. Right. And and the culture is, is so well-meaning in a misguided way that it is setting up the as the only allowable explanation for ongoing troubling racial disparities is racism. That is the only allowable explanation. If you are in a university setting and you even talk, if you talk even confidentially with sorrow and heartbreak about the struggles that your black students are experiencing because of racial preferences, you will be fired. It, it's a total taboo. The hilarious thing in this post-Tamas hysterical moment when the left says, oh, we can't condemn these protests because of our incredible dedication to free speech. We as universities are these bastions of free thinking. In fact, if, if you question on a university campus the ideology of endemic, ubiquitous white supremacy, if you question that, your career is over. There was a law professor at Georgetown Law School, who, a clinical professor, who had a private Zoom conversation with her fellow teacher lamenting the fact that year after year, her black students weren't doing as well. Hmm. And somehow this private Zoom conversation, and this was a conversation to try and figure out what they could do about it. She got fired. This was not even public remarks, and it was the truth. This happens again and again. The fear of the truth is that great that the people who speak it privately must be banned. Before I, before we move on on the issue of race, because I think it's just been such a huge part of our lives in the last few years, is how do we help these inner city communities? Mm -hmm. How do we see more successful doctors of color and Latinos who are coming in here and want to succeed? How do we have equal opportunity for everybody so that we can get the best doctors and possibly have 
a diverse array of doctors, but not choose them based on diversity, but choose them based on merit. How, how do you envision doing that? Stop tearing down the standards. The standards are not racist. We have to stop apologizing for expectations of excellence and stop having double standards. If you tell a student from the time he's aware that he's not going to have to meet the same standards as white and Asians, guess what? Why should he try? I remember in the 90s, the New York Times, when people were first waking up in a little itsy bitty way to the reality of racial preferences in college admissions. People had been paying attention, knew this was going on for a long time, but it was finally little bits of data were trickling out. And the New York Times wrote a story and, and it talked to some black students and they were quite overt about the fact that, well, I know I don't have to do homework to the same extent because I'll get admitted to college anyway. This is well known. High school students are not stupid. You know, they're all com comparing each other's SATs. They're seeing who got into which selective colleges with which SAT scores and who didn't. Yeah, well, of course, many of them are actually now faking it. They're they're pretending to be of color. I mean, a few years would. ago that there that guy VJ right. Jojo who right. pretend who was an Indian guy, he chopped his eyelashes a little bit and pretended to be black and he, he actually came out with a book called Almost Black. Right. And that's how he got into medical school. I say say I will believe in white privilege when I see a black student putting himself right. down as white. Instead, what you're going to have Every white male, if he could, would put himself down as black. Why wouldn't you? That's your key to success. <laughs> but if you want to help people, you do not lower expectations. Mm -hmm. We've, we, I mean, these are cliches. We've been saying this for decades. Nothing changes. But to bring up the cliche, soft bigotry of low expectations, George W. Bush, it's true. Mm -hmm. At this point, the bad news is, to be perfectly honest, there's not a hell of a lot of stuff that we haven't tried in other respects. Hmm. We've done the social services. The conservatives have their answer for closing the skills gap, vouchers, charter schools, school choice. Liberals have their answer, more school spending. We've been trying this for 60 years, Marissa. It hasn't really been working. This has been the problem of social policy in the United States, the core problem behind much else is the skills gap. And right now, I think the emphasis has to be on internal cultural change. Stop making excuses for blacks, and blacks have to stop making excuses for themselves. We need to empower, I mean, we, but all of this we've been trying. There are some incredible black voices out there, have been for decades, that speak about high expectations that are unwilling to accept excuses for criminality, mm. for disrespect, for the police, for, for law and order. Those voices need to be empowered. But you do not help people by tearing down standards and telling them that the, the world is stacked against them. There was nothing more enraging than the Biden speech at Morehouse College where he said, why should blacks believe in democracy when they're being killed? The implication was, you know, you don't need to be too hip to our present discourse. The fill in the gaps is when they're being killed by whites. Mm -hmm. That is complete lie. Blacks are killing each other at enormous rates. Yes, blacks die at 24 times the rate of whites. Blacks between the ages of 10 and 24 die of homicide at nearly 25 times the rate of whites. Is that a problem? Is that a civil rights problem? I would submit, yes, if you're a Black Lives Matter activist, I would be concerned about that problem. Black juveniles in the post-George Floyd race riot world are shot at 100 times the rate of white juveniles. That is a problem. If you're a Black parent, you should be worried about that. Joe Biden implies that the people who are killing those Blacks the people who are shooting those black juveniles are white, and that's why blacks should be suspicious of American democracy. The reality is those blacks are shooting each other. That's why they've got this astronomical death by homicide rate and shooting rate. And yet Biden got up there at Morehouse College. He said, if you're black today, you have to be 10 times better than anybody else. The reality is the opposite. 
We have to stop sending that message that gives blacks an excuse to hate our culture. Yes, our, our past was deplorable, hypocritical, stomach churning. The one thing I agree with, with the 1619 Project, I still think we have not taken full account of our history. That doesn't mean we pay reparations because every other culture was worse. Every other civilization had slavery. West Africa had slavery. West Africa decoupled from slavery only thanks to the British Navy, the Brits occupying Lagos saying you will not participate in the slave trade. I will pay reparations when they pay reparations. But right now, the reality is not that past. And we have to stop sending the message because we're never going to get over our racial problems unless we do. You were talking about crime uh, here in California. You you reported on this, the, the Racial Justice Act. <laughs> Can you explain what this is for those who are not following how bonkers California is going? No, I can't because it's inexplicable. It is the worst. It is, if you want to see critical race theory, leap the fence, which is already long done, into the world at large and take over the entire criminal justice system. This is it. Critical race theory, all of the, our racial nonsense is in academia. The fundamental view is every single American institution is racist to the core. It's all a plot to keep blacks down. So the Racial Justice Act says the criminal justice system is racist to the core, but it is so racist that we're not going to even ask you to prove that it's racist. If you're a black defendant, you can unwind, discredit the fact that you're being prosecuted for, let's say, gang murder. There's a special, if, if you commit murder as a gang member, you're going to be treated more harshly because we rightly understand that gang murders are worse. They're, they're retaliatory. They spread. They cause more havoc than uh, domestic violence where, you know, I'm not justifying domestic violence. It's a horrible thing, but that's a one-off. That's something that is kept within that domestic core. Whereas gang murder is feeds it's like on a itself. Cultural, right. it's, a, it's a cultural evolution. It's gonna, you're going to get a tit-for-tat murder. You yes. have one gang murder, you're just going to be another. It's going to spread. There's going to be innocent bystanders. So if you commit gang murder, you're going to be treated more harshly. But if you're a black defendant, you can just say that in the past, allegedly, black defendants were treated more harshly. Therefore, you cannot prosecute me. For murdering. For murdering as harshly as you would. I don't, I'm not saying that my prosecution was racist, that my jury was racist, that my judge was racist. But if in the past I claim that there was a problem, that gets me sort of off the hook today. Well, I'm just trying to digest this into my own words. So a defendant who murdered somebody yeah. could say that because other people right. who murdered somebody exactly. were treated poorly exactly. or unfairly, yep. therefore I, That's right. the actual murderer, right. should get away with it. Yes. That is what this Racial Justice Act means. Yes. It is explicitly overturns for California a Supreme Court precedent that is very analogous there was a case of a black man who had shot a white police officer fatally in Georgia. Yeah. And he was given the death penalty. He said, I've not been prosecuted racially, but in the past, I've got this study and it shows if you're a black person who kills a white person in Georgia, you're more likely to get a death penalty. I am not saying that in my case, I was the victim of racism. But in the past, this study purports to show that. Now, whether it really did or not, we can put that aside. The Supreme Court said, uh-uh, not good enough. If you want us to un overturn your death penalty, you need to show that in your case, the prosecutor was racist, or the jury was racist, or the judge was racist. It's not enough to say that in the past, there was a pattern of racism. California legislators said, we don't like this precedent. It's called McCleskey versus Kemp. It makes it too hard to show racism. You have to show it in an individual case, and that's too hard. 
we're throwing it out. And from now on, you don't have to show racism in the individual case. You just allege that the system is biased and that does the trick. So not only does this overturn the necessity of individual proof, now it's retroactive. So every prisoner in California right now can bring a lawsuit to reopen his case and say, there was a pattern of bias in my county where I was prosecuted. Therefore, I get to relitigate my case. It's opening the floodgates. The criminal defense bar, public defenders in California, they are ecstatic. They say explicitly, we have been handed a tool to take down what they view as a racist system. They are flooding. They are suffocating. They are burying district attorney's offices with data requests for 10 years worth of data so that they can produce these phony statistical studies. It is going to bring down a state that is already unable to protect toothpaste, to protect hardworking business owners who have put their savings on the line, who put their egos on the line to try to survive in a competitive cutthroat environment in the, in the chain of supply chain to try and survive. They're being robbed on a daily basis and government turns its eyes away and says, we're not going to protect you because that will have a racial disparate impact. If we enforce the law, we'll put more black criminals in prison. We don't want to do that. And government is basically allowing the citizens and business owners to twist in the wind. It's going to get worse because of the Racial Justice Act. It is so scary. I mean, nothing ruins a community more than crime. It's absolutely scary. You talk about the toothpaste. I can't go to CVS and actually just shop because everything's locked behind, you know, bars. I mean, Heather, this is really, really scary. And, and when we talk about DEI, and we talked about it a few years ago, the vibe that I would get from my liberal friends, and I have many liberal friends, believe it or not, they <laughs> would say, you. well, this is a, 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 a right wing talking point. It's really not impacting us. And, you know, really, it's, you know, you, you, you got to be nice. You got to be nice, Marissa. You got to be nice. And this is not an ivory tower conversation anymore. This is hitting the ground. It's hitting the streets. It's right. hitting us. It's hitting our medical field. The example you give right now on crime is as scary as it can get for anybody with any sort of sanity. And the other thing I would say about DEI and how it is no longer just an issue of talking points or or ivory tower discussions is the fact that the woke virus and DEI is allowing people to be mean. It really is giving people a, 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 a just an opportunity to be dangerous and mean. You, you talk about the culture, uh, the arts. You give an example in this book here, which never in my life will I forget this example. The fact that a New York theater told the white people to leave early. Mm -hmm so that the people of color could enjoy their time there. And then the New York Times actually lauded this mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. That is mean. It is mean. How are we okay with being treated like this? Well, that's a sort of a small, it's a symbol of what is happening in every single institution. What do you think racial preferences are? It's zero sum. You know, if if you're saying... We need to expand the proportion of blacks and, and Asians in medical school or engineering school uh, or, you know, a, a research lab. You're basically saying you got to make room for by getting rid of whites and Asians. And you have institution after institution explicitly celebrating the fact that it's gotten its white population down. Museums, we're so happy we have much fewer white docents. So that is now absolutely standard. The anti-white rhetoric is completely standard, and it's very bizarre. White people at this point are just accustomed that that's, of course, of course we should put up with this. It's really quite incredible. As you say, the double standards, if white people talked about blacks the way the culture in general talks about whites, which are, you know, white privilege, uh, white pathologies, you know, control freaks, racist, there would be a revolution. But this is just the norm. And I just to double back very briefly to, to finish off the 
criminal justice discussion, of course crime matters, and it is not an elitist ivory tower, you know, hothouse concern. The people that are hurt the most mm. are the poor that that cannot get police protection now. It's the small business owners that are having their merchandise plundered without help. But if you're confused by what's going on, if you're aware of the fact that everywhere, progressive prosecutor after progressive prosecutor, whether it's Alvin Bragg in, in New York, and believe it or not, there are things he doesn't prosecute, even though he goes like crazy after 34 alleged business felonies of Trump, um, but he actually mostly doesn't prosecute, or George Gascon in Los Angeles, or Kim Fox in Chicago. Again, it's all because of disparate impact. Everything that is weird and mysterious and just unfathomable in the criminal justice system today is is because if we enforce the law, it will have a disparate impact on black criminals, mm -hmm. not because the law is racist. It is not racist. It is because the crime problem is so high. That's what we have to solve. Again, do not tear down the standards, whether it's meritocratic standards of college medical school admissions or behavioral standards saying you don't get to beat up old ladies, sucker punch them. You don't need, you don't allow to do flash mobs of marauding down the magnificent mile, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, pummeling people. You don't get to do that. The standards are not racist. It's the behavior that has to change. The criminal behavior has to change. Keep the standards and expect everybody to live up to them. And, and so, yes, the, the disparagement of, of whites and of a, of a civilization that has nothing to apologize for because every other civilization engaged in the same imperialism, the same colonization, the same slavery as ours. I will not apologize until those civilizations apologize as well. Probably one of the most important things I wanted to talk to you about is what you're warning of us about next, and that <laughs> is the attack in the universities yeah. on Western civilization, yes. this love affair that American students are having with Hamas right now. Just what is going on, Heather? Like, how, how are American kids marching for a terrorist group, Hamas? How do you explain this? It comes from such rank ignorance that they do not know what the rest of the world looks like. They have been given, the only thing they know is it's been drummed into them that they are part of a guilty culture. And anything that is part of the inheritance of Western civilization, which historically it came out of Europe, Europe was demographically Caucasian. That's just the reality. China was demographically Chinese. That was the reality. Africa was demographically black. That was the reality. Our civilization was white. That doesn't make it guilty. It, it but simply, what does that have to do with Israel and, and, and Because Hamas? anything that they see as outside of Western civilization is now by definition, a victim of that civilization. So Israel to them is part of the West. Part of the West. And therefore, what is opposed to Israel is by definition virtuous. And so if Israel is fighting against terrorists who are not the West, those terrorists must be because they are in a binary relationship with Israel, victims and virtuous. And so it is a very simple formula with which these college kids now approach the world. Anything that falls under the Western camp, evil. Anything that falls outside the Western camp, good and virtuous and can do no wrong. And so Israel is now the epitome of Western success. It is meritocratic. It is competitive. It is economically successful. It has mastered poverty and paucity and a harsh desert climate. It has created a, f a successful economy. It is now, because of that, evil. And, and anything that is fighting Israel is good. It goes no further than that. You know as well as I do, and, and anybody knows, these 
college students know nothing about Middle East history other than a few potted phrases that's been given to them by their anti-colonial studies classes. Uh, and and this comes in a half a century long now tradition of glorifying student protest and thinking that somehow students have something to tell the world when in fact they should be seen and not heard. There is nothing that students know about the world that has any value whatsoever. One exception, Tiananmen Square Massacre, like once in a 50 years, students are right about something. They were right about communist China. But basically in the West, I can think of very little. The students were right about the civil rights struggle. They were right there too. But we went way overboard of glorifying student protests so that now, you know, I remember in the 90s, these aging baby boomer professors would say, gee, where's all the student protests? You know, these students are way too passive. That's a good thing. If they'd been studying, which they weren't doing, they were partying. But basically, the less we hear from students, the better our culture will be because they're total ignoramuses. They're privileged. They live in a cocoon. They have no idea of the centuries of success and how lucky they are to live in America. It's kind of interesting the way you put it, that the culture really takes the cue on what to do from our college students who are in their 20s and have basically no life experience. When when you put it out that way, it actually, it's like, Heather, I think you got it right. But what what is so fascinating to me, and I just want to, I want to just harp on this for a minute because I, I don't think anybody has put it the way you put it. The fact that these American students are so upset with Israel is because they associate Israel with the West. And so therefore they're supporting Hamas because right. Hamas is anti-West and right. anti-Israel, right. which is why they don't give a damn when there are Christians in Africa who are being massacred. Mm-hmm. They don't care about the Muslims in Syria who are right. being massacred. They don't care about the Yazidi girls in, in the Middle East who are being yep. massacred. You have millions and millions of people around the world who are being massacred by non-Westerners. And so therefore it's okay. But when you have a war between a a, a small country that to them represents the West Mm -hmm. and non-Westernized militias, right, right? which is basically what what these Muslim brotherhoods and Hamas and Hezbollah are, our American kids are supporting them. Mm -hmm. It's stunning. It's it's the same structure here, actually. The victim is an excuse. The victim... It's all fake. It's not about the victim. It's about the alleged perpetrator. So again, if it was if it was Somalis beating up on Palestine, it wouldn't matter. The same thing happens here. Like I ask myself, Black Lives Matter. I thought Black Lives Matter. There are dozens of black Americans that are being gunned down in homicide every single day. That's more than all white and Hispanic homicide victims combined. Even though blacks are only 13% of the population, there are more black homicide victims being killed every day, even though they're only 13% of the population, than all white and Hispanic homicide victims combined. The Black Lives Matter activists say nothing because it's not about the victims. It's about whites. The People that are killing those black victims are other blacks. It's the same thing in the Middle East. It's not about the Palestinians. It's about the Israelis. It's hatred for the Israelis because they're white, seen as white now, and they're part of the West. That is how you explain every single puzzling binary dichotomy in our world today. It's not about the victims. Wow. They don't give a damn about the victims. All right. You outline all these names of young kids under the age of 20 who have been shot and nobody knows their name. Children, one-year-old black kids after George Floyd, three-year-olds shot in their beds, shot in their front yard, shot playing on a trampoline, shot at a birthday party, shot in a park, brain dead, killed, heart-wrenching. Nobody ever says their names. Uh, mm-hmm. I have never heard a Black Lives Matter activist protest once when it's a black-on-black killing. I I invite somebody to tell me about it. It has never happened. Al Sharpton, Benjamin Crump, the civil rights attorney, so-called, for black victims, 
went to Minneapolis on the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death. They went to George Floyd Hagiography Square. You know, they, they did the obeisance to the drug addict. At that time, there were two black children in hospital in North Minneapolis who'd been shot in these barbaric drive-by shootings on life support. One died a few, a girl died a few days later. The boy will be brain dead for life. They didn't show up. They never said their names because they were shot by other black people. It, it matters not. They don't care about black victims. It's not about the victims. It's about the perpetrators and that, and in this case, phantom perpetrators because the police are not the problem for blacks. Whites are not the problem. Black criminals are the problem. Lack of fathers is the problem. And there are many blacks who desperately want the police, who desperately mm. want law and order. Of I've made a career of going to inner city police community meetings and giving voice to these elderly black women who say, thank God for the police. They are my friends. The New York Times never talks to those people. Thank God for the police. They're yep. our friends. That's Absolutely. Right. We need to give them so much courage and, and honor. Yep. So I want to end this difficult conversation with something somewhat positive, yeah. and that is hmm. People may hear about all these elements of our society that have been torn apart from, from police to the universities to the medical system. Everything that matters to us mm -hmm. is, is under attack. It's very easy to feel despair. It's very easy to just say, I'm going to crawl into a ball and disappear. But we, we can't give up on America. I say this to everybody. People who fought in World War II also thought that there's nothing worth fighting for anymore because it's over. Mm -hmm. Then we're reminded when we look back in history that fighting is worth it because ultimately that's what we have to do. Right. So if I want to go home this weekend and pray with my family and gain strength, what is a piece of music? What is a piece of music that you recommend for us to turn on and just nourish our souls and hear some beauty and find strength? I know you're the person to ask because you're, you're along with Dennis Prager, you're my other music buff. So give us a fun thing to do, a fun piece of homework from Prager University, music that's just going to nourish our souls and give us some strength. How funny. Well, if you want something really that will just give you so much energy, I would say, uh, the overture to Mozart's opera, The Magic Marriage of Figaro, Le Nozze di Figaro in, in Italian, that is just, it is effervescent, sublime, filled with such exuberance and, and absolute happiness with life. Uh, so that's a start. If you want something more profound that will expose you to some of the greatest sorrows and, and grandeur of human expression, Box St. Matthew Passion. That is not that is not a happy work, but it is something that is as deep as it gets. I love it. Thank you. Thank you.